Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much uh, for inviting me here. It's uh, great to get back up to Queensland again. Um, I was in Canberra yesterday morning and uh, made it via Sydney last night to be here. So um, I'm very glad to be here. I'm going to speak, and I know there may be a bit of overlap between the three presentations here on the case uh, for emerging market investing. Um, you've probably heard all sorts of acronyms. We're drowning in a sea of acronyms. Um, I'm not really going to address the fact, other than to say that everybody is trying to slice and dice this asset class uh, in, uh, in their own particular way, and each of these asset classes, uh, each of these acronyms, uh, tries to do it slightly differently. I think we need to understand that emerging markets have, generally speaking, performed very well uh, this century, and I will show you that. Uh, I'll probably show you how some of the trends and opportunities are giving investors um, more encouragement, perhaps, than they've had for a very long time to start taking this asset class seriously. And I am beginning to see essentially a cracking of the home bias, especially in the West, towards this uh, part of the world. Uh, and I'm also going to speak a little bit to the fact that uh, Western investors in particular, and those in Europe and the United States specifically, uh, are being forced to look at assets in the emerging world because of the problems they're having in their own markets. It's well known to you all that emerging markets are now starting to grow uh, fairly dramatically, not just in an absolute sense, but relative to what's happening in the developed world, which seems to have come, broadly speaking, to something of a standstill. And in fact, as we speak, we're at that crossover point, at least in terms of PPP, uh, where the GDP of emerging markets will uh, be larger than that of the developed world. This is, of course, because the higher levels of growth that are being uh, achieved in the emerging world, and that uh, achievement is going to be sustained uh, for much of the next four or five decades. Uh, essentially, uh, the blue at the top uh, is going to be increasingly compressed down to less than 20 percent of its uh, of total growth generated by the global economy. That growth as well is of a very high quality. Uh, it's not as debt rich as it is uh, in the developed world and it's something with which I think a lot of investors uh, find uh, a lot of uh, agreement at the moment. Uh, Western growth is still too, too much driven uh, by consumption. Uh, yes, consumption is emerging, and that's one of the great stories of emerging markets, but it's underpinned by continuing growth in investment. Indeed, the trend is so dramatic that by 2050, uh, the four BRIC economies, Brazil, Russia, India, China, will be amongst the top six economies uh, in the world. Uh, one other economy I should mention, because it's uh, close to your hearts and to your nation, is that of Indonesia, which is something of a dark horse in Asia at the moment. It will be, uh, by the end of this decade, uh, a, a top 10 economy uh, in the world. That said, it has to be acknowledged that in the very short term, over the last couple of years, uh, while we've been going through what in Australia is always called the GFC, uh, the global financial crisis, but really is more accurately described as a Western financial crisis with some uh, implications for the world at large. Uh, yes, emerging markets have uh, underperformed, but largely because investors uh, in the West have essentially drawn in their horns, taken risk off the table, and essentially uh, become very safe uh, in their investing strategies. This has resulted in monies being withdrawn from emerging markets. But if you look at the last decade as a whole, you see that emerging markets have strongly uh, outpaced uh, developed markets. And in the first um, decade, for instance, Latin America gave you a 500 percent return uh, as compared to essentially flat performance in most Western countries, though not in Australia. And Australia is unique in this respect. This is what we call a smarty box. It's very busy, but let me decipher it for you. It looks at all the asset classes year on year, which is the top performer and which is the bottom performer. What I'm going to ask you to look at is what's happening in the pink categories, and you can see the pattern uh, since 1994 there. Uh, that's emerging market debt, uh, essentially been a very good performer during the 1990s, uh, less so, but remember we're talking about fixed income here. Uh, in, the, in the last 10 years. Broadly speaking, uh, and this is where we uh, as uh, people who manage emerging markets addressing Australian investors need to work very hard, it's had a similar sort of track record to Aussie bonds. 
Um, equities uh, obviously has had a more volatile um, run, but as you can see, other than 2008 and the year that we're in at the moment, 2011, uh, since uh, the turn of the century, equities has done extraordinarily well, broadly speaking, in emerging markets. We think that these uh, markets are now starting to operate quite, in quite a similar way, and you can see that because valuations are now starting to converge. But you have to remember a PE doesn't take into consideration the growth, and the growth you're getting in emerging markets is far better. Uh, so the peg ratio, for those of you who look at such things, uh, is much better in emerging markets than it is, by and large, uh, in the developed world. Yet the irony is, of course, that emerging markets remain uh, undercapitalized relative to the uh, size of their economies and their populations. Uh, there's not a lot of market cap yet in emerging markets, which is why we think this uh, is a great opportunity to get invested into them. You can see how uh, the rest of the world is heavily capitalized, but emerging markets, both in equity and fixed income, is still, relatively speaking, underdeveloped. Uh, indeed, when people talk about, for instance, frontier markets, those markets beyond even emerging markets, the definition often used is that they have an extremely immature capital market, not just an immature capital market, but an extremely immature capital market. But that doesn't mean that there isn't uh, plenty of opportunity in these spaces. This is going to change. Standard Charter did a great report last year, the now famous Super Cycle Report, which is still available on their website. And this will show you, in their estimation, what's going to happen over the next 30 years. In terms of global market cap in 2009, the new world was about a third of the world. Their forecast is by 2030 it will be close to three quarters. More importantly, look at the numbers underneath. You see the new world going from 17 trillion to 235 trillion, whereas the old world can only manage from 28 to 87. What we're now beginning to see is a slow but steady breakdown in home bias out of the West and into the rest. Home bias is the preference that uh, is perfectly natural that uh, investors, generally speaking, have ha for investing at home. That said, we're beginning to see this crumble. Uh, it's crumbling in uh, different degrees in different places in the world. I can go to Scandinavia and have very mature conversations with investors there about emerging and even frontier markets. If I go to New York, I can't. Uh, New York is still, uh, by comparison to the ease of the conversation that I'm having in Helsinki or Stockholm, a relatively immature place when it comes to understanding emerging markets. But I hope people like Lance Bernstein are slowly but surely chipping away uh, at that home bias. We are beginning to see, however, the smart investors move. And the smart investors in particular, I would say, are uh, the sovereign wealth funds. Uh, I've seen 22 sovereign wealth funds in the last year, the most recently in Alberta. And essentially, what we're beginning to see uh, is a slow leakage uh, from the sovereign wealth funds into the emerging world. And you can see how it's an out of uh, the West and into the rest trade, even this year, when emerging markets have underperformed, that is slowly characterizing what is going on. I would say that this is partly because the West is starting to realize that in many respects the game is up, and this is by far the most important chart that I've seen in the last year. It came from Societe Generale. They essentially superimposed the demographic life cycles of all the major regions of the world on the date of 2010 and worked out which were the old nations of the world and which were the young ones. Japan came out as the oldest, more people over the age of 70 than under the age of 20, sorry, over the age of 60 than under the age of 20, followed by pretty much neck and neck Europe and the United States. The sweet spot of the cycle is occupied by Asia. Uh, Africa might be old geologically, but it's very young economically, and Latin America would probably come somewhere in between. You might ask, and I always am usually when I'm in Australia, where does Australia fit into this? Well, you're not classically part of the West. You're somewhere uh, in between, uh, and I would argue becoming more part of Asia and less part of the West as each year goes by. Essentially, however, in the life cycles of nations, and indeed the life cycle of capital, which is limit linked to the idea, emerging markets are at the beginning of the process, not like developed markets, which are by and large, and I'll show you that in a different way at the end. 
The problem is that the West is showing very worrying signs of Japanization, which basically means no growth. And where there's no growth, it's very difficult to make capital productive, which is why the most productive part of Western capital at the moment are those multinationals that are investing into the new world. And those multinationals, for me, um, are the ones I under, uh, sort of think are really telling us what's going on in the world. In the life cycle of nations, the development life cycle, the classic S-curve or Gompertz curve looks something like this. There are, broadly speaking, three zones, uh, and I'll show you and define them for you in a minute. But from a corporate perspective, there is the first zone uh, and the second zone and the third zone. It's the second zone where volumes are rising fast that, generally speaking, is attracting corporate investment today. And that is where the grass is greenest, most nutritious and fastest growing. That, of course, is emerging markets. Uh, zone one would be frontier markets, a space where the grass is greening up and becoming more attractive by the day. Zone three would be developed markets. And there, I'm afraid, there are increasingly brown patches in their grass. And it's becoming uh, increasingly obvious that capital is not going to be very productively used there. Let me leave you with one uh, other way of looking at what's going on in the world today. And that is, look at it through the eyes of cities. Uh, cities essentially will tell you where the action is in the world. And we are beginning to see two groups of cities emerge, the cities of the old world, which are becoming increasingly static, and the cities of the new world, which are starting to grow up. And that's something which uh, McKinsey did a great study, was able to show that the growth in GDP is heavily correlated to the whole concept of urbanization. And that's underwritten by uh, increase in consumerize, uh, consumerization as well. What we begin to see now is that it's the emerging world, which is where most of the growth in cities is taking place. Indeed, it's the emerging market cities that are going to generate 95% of uh, the, consuming uh, the new consumption over uh, coming period. Uh, that those em the emerging 440, the largest 440 cities in the emerging world, will account for 60% of this increase in consumer spending. McKinsey summarized their whole presentation by uh, plotting essentially where the cities of the world are. And take it from me that when you look at it, essentially emerging market cities are very much at the beginning of the economic life cycle. And this is why capital is intrigued by this. Capital, generally speaking, doesn't like getting involved at the end of a life cycle. Quite obviously, uh, the growth is going to come from getting involved at the beginning. And this is where emerging market cities are now concentrated. Contrast this to where the developed market cities are. They're increasingly concentrated at the end of the life cycle, which basically means they're ex-growth, and, and that doesn't really attract capital. Thank you very much. Please now welcome Morgan Harting. Thank you, and good morning. One of the things that I find most interesting about uh, coming to Australia and talking to Australian plans about emerging markets is you already get it. You get that emerging markets already represent a very large proportion of global economic activity. You get that this proportion is increasing over time. Um, you get that ESG issues, are, though they're important everywhere, are even more important in emerging markets. As Michael said, people in New York are a little slower to catch on to this. Uh, perhaps in Helsinki, they're a bit further ahead. But I think Australians truly are among developed market investors uh, at the vanguard of their thinking about investing emerging, in emerging markets. And you also recognize that it's impossible to generalize about emerging markets as a whole. This is a very heterogeneous group that presents unique challenges. Um, but you have questions. Uh, you recognize that large as emerging markets are in the opportunity set today, it's going to increase even more. And uh, so you're thinking about increasing your exposure to emerging markets further still. Um, you want to improve the risk profile of your exposure to emerging markets, recognizing that these countries do bring growth, but they also bring a lot of volatility and other types uh, of 
of risks. And um, so you're asking your managers. You're asking your asset consultants about these questions. And I thought it'd be most uh, productive to take advantage of my time to share with you some of our thoughts. Um, so I won't belabor the idea here, therefore, that emerging markets represent, as you see in this display in the blue line, rising, uh, an increasing proportion of the opportunity set in equities, now about 13% of the market cap of, of global equities. In terms of debt, it's lower. Um, but significant. Uh, I will say that Aussie plans are somewhat behind um, in their exposure to emerging debt, but I think that reflects the fact that Aussie plans generally have more equities than debt than other developed countries. So it's not so much a difference in mentality, but just a difference in overall asset allocation versus plans in other regions. Um, I haven't included alternatives here. Uh, I don't think of that as an asset class so much as a set of strategies that tap into debt and equity securities. And I haven't included currency. I don't think of that as an asset class either, but rather a source of both risk and return to be managed in an integrated way in any strategy, but particularly in emerging markets. So you get, of course, that though emerging markets represent about 13% of the equity opportunity set, they represent about one-third of global economic activity today. This is without adjusting for purchasing power parity, so this assumes that the Chinese exchange rate, market exchange rate, is fair. That's debatable. This is the IMF data. Uh, but either way, clearly increasing. And it begs, begs the question, well, how is it that emerging equities represent just 13% of the equity opportunity set, but these countries represent a third of global economic activity? How do you square um, that difference? Um, part of it is that many, uh, much of the economic activity in these countries is captured by companies listed in the developed world. Again, Aussies get this. You understand that when you invest in Rio, you're making an investment in emerging markets. Uh, so you're ahead of the curve there. And if you've stuck to this, you've done well. These are the cumulative returns of emerging equity, emerging debt, and emerging currency over the last decade or so. The top line being equity. Basically, you've quadrupled your money in a little bit less than a decade. Emerging equities clearly being the most leveraged to that economic growth. Emerging debt, the middle line uh, in, in red, has you've nearly tripled your money. Uh, now here, uh, this is, of course, consistent with the experience you've had, as you saw from Michael's presentation, with bonds in other geographies as well. Global interest rates have come down around the world. The credit spread in emerging markets has uh, compressed even more uh, because of the improvement in fundamentals. So that's been a benefit, uh, and that's caused these very strong returns in emerging debt. Currency hasn't done much for you, about a 30% return cumulatively uh, over 10 years. Past performance does not guarantee future results, I show in small print, uh, as always. But it really is important here. As you think about designing your policies and what the appropriate uh, proportional exposure to these asset classes is, you really can't rely on the past in emerging markets. Um, though we see over the last decade, uh, emerging equities delivered about a nearly 16% return in US dollar terms, about 10 uh, for debt, but with a lot of volatility. So you think about the next decade, that won't be repeated for either equity or debt, notwithstanding the strong growth. Maybe you'll get a 10% return in US dollar terms, add a few percentage points more for Aussie dollar terms from the equity. Thinking about an earnings yield um, you know, in the low teens, paying about a 10%, uh, a 10 times multiple, it's about a 10% return. In debt, maybe you'll make four and a half. That's less than half what you got in the last decade. But how could you make more? Even four and a half is more than what emerging bonds are yielding today. That's how much yields have come down because of this flood of capital into emerging markets. And if global yields come up just a little bit, that's going to eat into your capital. It's going to be very difficult to assume more than about a 4.5% return uh, in emerging debt. But what you can expect is that emerging equities will remain very volatile, and more volatile than developed equities. I'm showing here, call it a 25% volatility expected from emerging listed equities. So this is the dilemma. You know that these are the countries that are growing fast. As Michael said, this is where capital is going to be moving. 
but it's going to continue to be a more volatile part of the capital markets, as it has been over the last decade. The blue line shows the volatility of emerging equities, the red for developed. So even though the fundamentals of developed countries have been and are likely to continue to be horrendous by comparison in terms of government debt, credit crises, uh, that's not going to change overnight. But even through all of that, emerging equities, which fundamentally were in much better shape over the last few years, were still more volatile. And in times of stress, they sold off even more. That's probably going to continue. How can you address that? How can you increase your exposure to these countries without increasing your overall portfolio volatility? We have a few different thoughts on this. One is that emerging debt can be useful, not so much as a source of return, but as a way to dampen the volatility of your equities. Emerging debt's very correlated with emerging equities, but it has lower volatility. You can selectively choose certain emerging debt securities to complement your emerging equity exposures and reduce the volatility and keep exposed to that emerging equity beta. You should use currency actively. It's a source of return, but even more of risk. And you can think of currency as a way to hedge exposures or to get exposure to places where, at a particular point in time, you don't find equity or debt investments attractive. We think including developed listed securities is a no-brainer. You all get this, right? When you're invested in Rio, it's an emerging investment. You should think of that as part of your emerging exposure, as you already do. Again, this is more the lecture for people uh, in New York. Include so-called frontier securities these countries that the index providers call frontier, even though this is a very diverse group of countries. But many of them are at these earlier stages of development. These are the countries that defined emerging markets 10 or 15 years ago that are going to be growing quickly, that are undergoing greater structural changes than places like Korea or Taiwan, which are further along and not entirely played out, but certainly better understood. ESG is critical. Again, Aussie investors are much further ahead. Um, we, uh, we absolutely agree. We, too, are signatories of the UNPRI. This is even more important in emerging markets, particularly in the smaller countries that are even less transparent and where governance, environmental, and social issues are all the more uh, serious. That's a source of risk. And that needs to be integrated in the investment process at every stage, particularly in emerging markets. So um, let me give you two examples of how you can do this in an integrated portfolio, how you can bring down the risk of investing in emerging markets in comparison to a naive approach of just buying the EM equity index or a traditional EM equity active manager benchmark to one of the uh, standard benchmarks. One is developed listed equities. Um, so there are certain cases where um, it just makes so much more sense to take your exposure uh, through a developed listed company. These will vary over time. But I give an example from last year. Um, if you think about the Chinese auto market, this is, as I show in the display in the upper right, the largest auto market in the world. And if you think about an industry that is aligned with a country's economic growth, it's autos. So if you want to tap into the Chinese growth story, you've got to be thinking about autos. The problem is the two largest auto companies that dominate the industry are basically off limits to you. One is totally government owned, and the other requires an A share quota. And so you can't trade it in the same way. So you're stuck with the second tier, unless you can be a little more clever about it. Unless you can think of, say, buying an auto parts company that sells parts to those manufacturers. Think of a tire company like Sumitomo Rubber, which has a massive factory in China selling to these uh, most competitive Chinese auto companies. They also have a big plant in Indonesia selling to other parts of Asia. They happen to be listed in Japan. They also have a plant in Japan, a plant that was not affected by the tsunami last year. But nonetheless, uh, Sumitomo Rubber shares sold off together with all Japanese shares after that tragic event. It created a very interesting equity, uh, sorry, a very interesting entry point for investors who weren't forced to define the emerging investment opportunity set by those companies that happen to be listed in emerging markets, or more specifically in this case, in China. And yet you get all the benefits of the growth of the Chinese auto sector uh, over time. Another thing that I think is really interesting is the so-called frontier. Now, here's a set of countries that 
many plans restrict themselves from investing in. You tell your manager, no frontier at all, or you tell them, OK, but up to 5%. This creates artificially depressed prices. This means that you can pick out certain companies that trade at artificially depressed multiples. Take a company like Commercial Bank of Qatar. This is a bank that has very well capitalized, has had steady growth, is expected to continue to have steady growth, um, but it's artificially, artificially depressed and it's multiple, trades at about 10 times earnings last year, uh, because so many investors say, I, I can't touch it. It's in this country that terrifies me. It's in the Persian Gulf and it's called a frontier country by MSCI. Even though Qatar is the wealthiest country in the world on a per capita basis, even though Qatar is growing as fast or faster than China, even though S&P rates the government of Qatar double A, and unlike the government of my home country, it's not on negative outlook. This, according to the debt markets, is nearly riskless. According to the equity markets, it's terrifying. That's a disagreement I can exploit as an active manager. I can say, I like these shares. They pay a 10% dividend yield. I can buy tail risk protection in the debt market for about 1% a year. That tail risk protection is worth something to me because it's in the Persian Gulf. And the reality is, when you have geopolitical risk spiking in that region, everything in that region sells off. And that means the value of that insurance you can buy so cheaply in the credit markets goes up. That's interesting to me. That's much cheaper tail risk protection than what I could get if I were to buy an equity put uh, through the equity markets, which is priced off of the implied volatility, which is very high because people expect uh, this to be risky. Um, so you can get cheap tail risk protection if you can take advantage of these categories and miscategorizations. The opportunity for active management, I think, is well understood to be better in emerging markets because it's less well covered. Not everyone gets the fact that this frontier category creates even more potential for um, a, uh, active advantage uh, if you can be unconstrained and if you can think about building a portfolio that's truly integrating debt and equity exposures. Not simply saying, I've got an equity portfolio in emerging markets, I've got a debt portfolio, I'm going to just bolt them together because when I look backward, these were complementary asset classes. Going forward, the money to be made and the better efficiency is in integrating your positions at the security level and considering currency and using every lever you have. And in doing so, you can build a better portfolio. You can capture the return that you see on this efficient frontier, uh, or not the, the security market line, on the red uh, box here, the emerging market equity return, equity beta, call it 13% in Aussie dollars over the next decade. But you don't have to take on that 25% volatility. Through strategies like this, you can reduce the overall portfolio volatility down to a level comparable to developed market volatility, and in doing so, allow you to achieve this objective of moving more of your portfolio into emerging markets without increasing your overall portfolio volatility. So not increasing the risk overall by shifting to these higher growth countries. So I will stop there soon. Thank you. Thank you, Morgan. Please welcome Slim Ferriani. Thank you, Sue. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to uh, this uh, very, very impressive event. It's a privilege and um, a pleasure to be among such an impressive and, um, and uh, uh, quite knowledgeable crowd. So it's, this is going to be quite humbling, I think. I've been asked with the third bit to uh, kind of give a view on uh, how to um, implement a portfolio. And uh, my comments are going to be quite biased by uh, the nature of my business, uh, which is only emerging and frontier markets. And uh, the strategy is more of a multi-manager fund to fund approach. So uh, please take, bear that in mind as to uh, why I'm saying what I'm going to be saying. Uh, I've been asked to uh, touch on a handful of uh, points, the first one being uh, due diligence. 
We're talking about the people's business, and uh, therefore it's very crucial that uh, we do a lot of homework on the people we're involved with uh, as far as uh, uh, putting together an emerging market portfolio. Uh, so that involves multiple visits uh, as far as the way we do it anyways on the ground. Uh, it takes a couple of years. It's very crucial that we build a relationship of trust uh, so that we are in a position of uh, high confidence and high um, conviction in terms of uh, the people we're going to be selecting on behalf of um, our clients. Uh, because there are hundreds and hundreds of choices out there. It's a very, very crowded space, if I could put it that way. And it's a very competitive space. And the uh, objective for us is to select the best of breed uh, worldwide on behalf of the clients. Uh, now, some of these points would, uh, relate, would apply also to a direct equities portfolio. Management is crucial. We are investing in companies and we're investing in funds uh, that rely on, on, on management. So we need to look at the histories, the experience, the staff turnover. Uh, staff turnover is an important part, one because we think stability is, uh, is key uh, for the sustainability of um, the process and the performance. And we pay a lot of attention uh, to that. Incentivization is important. We love to see passionate and enthusiastic people, but we want to see them also properly incentivized so that they're there in five, ten years' time. Um, Ownership structure is important, accessibility too. Um, we want to make sure that we can get hold of the key people whenever we want to, rather than you know, uh, be lucky if we see them once a year or get a call from them once a year, and corporate governance. Um, then process, obviously, uh, it's rather common sense uh, stuff, uh, looking at the systems, risk management, etc. things that you'd be quite familiar with, uh, obviously. Structure uh, of the vehicle we'll be uh, investing in, uh, in terms of the legal, uh, domicile, etc., uh, across a big, big range of funds. Uh, and and um, uh, that is you know, a side of qualitative risk that we want to make sure that uh, we, we take care of. Because we don't feel comfortable with all jurisdictions, uh, so we're quite picky uh, in there. Now, all of these three, first three bullet points are qualitative. Uh, then the quant bit of it is important, performance. Uh, for a fund, obviously, we talk about uh, the returns and the consistency and repeatability of these returns, uh, but also the risk-adjusted risk side to the returns. Uh, we are in the business of preserving capital for our clients, all of us in this room, uh, and uh, we are in the business also uh, in maximizing the compound annual returns for them over the years. So his historic performance is important uh, as long as we have uh, conf confidence in the fact that it's repeatable. Uh, uh, when it comes to direct equities portfolio, then there's a lot more quant that goes in there. Uh, we need to dissect the balance sheets and cash flow, etc. This is another humbling question. What should trustees be asking? Uh, and many of you have to deal with trustees out there, very smart people. Uh, well, just try to have uh, a few uh, ideas in terms of what we uh, would think trustees should be asking. We deal with boards ourselves with our own funds. Uh, well, first question that makes sense is why increase the uh, uh, allocation to emerging markets and, and, and growth market uh, equities? I mean, we, we started using the definition of growth markets uh, rather than just emerging and frontier, actually. And I think we've been talking about both uh, uh, this morning. One question that's uh, not on the slide in there is what's the cost and opportunity, what's the risk and opportunity cost of not having enough emerging and frontier market exposure uh, over the next five, ten years for any globally diversified portfolio? Uh, what's the competitive edge? Uh, because as I said, there's lots of people out there, a lot of smart people, and we need to narrow it down to the few that uh, we feel are best of breed. Uh, are the interests aligned? Of course, that is also crucial. We want to make sure that all interests are aligned. If there are performance fees, then it's not the end of the world, as long as it's not the stupid 20% or anything, but something like 5% on the alpha, we think, you know, aligns the interest properly. Uh, does the manager have capacity? Uh, that is also an issue that uh, we uh, come across now in the sense that uh, lots of big names manage $50 billion plus now in the emerging market world. And that, we feel, is a lot of money uh, for this still relatively small asset class, uh, which means that you'll be bound to focus on the large cap liquid stocks. And effectively, anything above 10 billion, frankly, we think that you are are going to be stuck mainly with the large cap um, liquid stocks. So there's nothing wrong with that, but we think that missing out on the uh, mid and small cap um, is, uh, is, is, is a big missed opportunity, and therefore we think it should be combined then with um, some, uh, some managers focusing on that, on that space. 
The next issue is governance. That is, I think, the Achilles heel for uh, the growth market story, frontier and emerging. And I have a slide here talking about developed markets governance. Uh, and I think the message is that it's not that perfect. This is a slide showing uh, Mr. Madoff. Anyone knows Mr. Madoff? I think he's a global celebrity these days. And um, he's got his new friend there, uh, his cellmate, asking him on the first day whether if Mr. Madoff um, were to uh, get a cigarette from him uh, today, then he'll give him 10 the following week. It does sound too good to be true. And whenever something is too good to be true, then probably better to uh, stay away from it. And the um, bottom line is corporate governance and governance issues is a global issue. This is not really only about emerging and frontier markets. Yes, there are different degrees of corporate governance. Uh, in the Western world, we feel that 10 is the top mark. We don't believe that uh, that's reached by any uh, of the uh, Western uh, countries out there. And uh, some names like Facebook, anyone? Um, again, uh, some young guy in a t-shirt can make a billion dollar uh, without asking what the board of directors think. Uh, concepts like voting rights and minority shareholders are totally alien. Um, and of course, a list of banks out there, they've had their own issues, whether it's JP Morgan and UBSs of this world, etc. cetera. So uh, we can pick on the emerging world, but I think it would be unfair to just focus on them. Uh, and the point is there's a marginal and structural improvement in there, and that's what we think people should be um, uh, rewarding those countries for. So governance, transparency, reputational risks, uh, we put them all in one uh, uh, camp in there as far as covering this issue. Uh, the perception, we think there's a perception versus reality gap. The perception is very, very negative uh, about the emerging world, and it's true. Uh, I mean, Korea, uh, talking about cor corporate governance, is a case in point, and people focus on it. But you know, places like South Africa, various countries in Latin America, etc., level of corporate governance is um, quite high. So everything is relative, and we think you've got to kick the tire, you've got to do your homework, and you can, it's not just you know a generalist, you know, blanket type of. Uh, uh, strategy. Uh, you got to pick uh, your stocks, uh, you got to pick your management. And one way of doing it is to focus more on the uh, privately managed companies rather than state owned companies uh, in the uh, growth markets world. Um, strong due diligence and diversification of portfolio reduce the rep reputational risks because that's what people um, are worried about. And, um, and in, uh, in that sense, uh, we live in a, in, in a world of great, great uncertainty and great risk aversion. And that is leading, I think, people to the extreme of focusing on the IBM effect. Uh, so we have a lot of trustees and boards and asset allocators uh, feeling more comfortable with the big names, big name house and, and, and staff and managers. And uh, that is re very much reflective of the mindset right now. Uh, because if big uh, house X and uh, staff and manager Y goes wrong, then uh, it's not going to be the end of the world. It's the, it's, it's the opposite if, it, uh, if it's a small boutique. And so we've gone from a world in 06 and 07 where boutiques, specialist dedicated managers were highly appreciated because they were focused and dedicated to what they do. Uh, so small was beautiful to a world where we live now where size does matter. And that is very much reflective in, 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 in the way people are allocating their, their money. Uh, last but not least, I was asked to talk about monitoring emerging markets. That's quite a task. It sounds simple, but uh, because we're talking about 50 investable markets, about 20 or so emerging and about um, uh, 30 plus frontier markets, including Qatar, as mentioned um, earlier. Uh, so a simple framework for us to monitor emerging markets, uh, such a diverse uh, uh, group of countries, quality of sovereign balance sheets, uh, FX reserves. A country like Russia with half a trillion dollars today is definitely less risky, we feel, than the Russia of 98, where they had barely any cushion in terms of FX reserves, and it, it did go bust and defaulted, so the, default, the Russian default crisis. So we think those kind of things are important to keep an eye on. Uh, valuation, we prefer cheap rather than uh, priced for perfection. Uh, growth, not just GDP growth, uh, but more importantly, sales growth at the corporate and micro level, and even more importantly, earnings growth. That is what's gonna drive uh, share prices and returns. And last but not least in this framework of monitoring is change. Uh, we live in a dynamic world, so we wanna see what's going on at the political level. Places like Northern Africa do remind us of that. Places like Tunisia, Egypt, etc., did remind us of the importance of politics. But also, any, any change on the demographic level, are we talking about an aging uh, population or not, etc., etc. Fund flows are crucial. 
uh, the technical aspect uh, to, uh, to, to markets have, has become important, so ETFs, etc. and so that's something that Michael did touch on to some extent. Uh, and the extensive country visits, uh, second bullet point there, uh, is, uh, we think, important. You've got to go and kick the tire and visit dozens of countries to appreciate the reality on the ground versus whatever perception CNNs and CNBCs and the media of this world want to give us. Uh, so, la so final point here, we think that uh, we are biased towards the active way of managing uh, an emerging market portfolio. We think if you stick with an active manager that has uh, the talent and the skill uh, to pick stocks and to pick managers, over the long term, it pays off. And, uh, and it pays off because the tide will turn. And on that theme of uh, the tide turning, uh, I thought I'll, I'll mention a couple of slides in here. This slide is the cross asked correlation, uh, three year rolling. Um, what it shows in there, it's uh, various asset classes, equities, MSCI world uh, for the equities, then you have fixed income, commodities, uh, property, and hedge funds. This is what you know, typically uh, we, uh, the different kind of uh, categories of asset classes. We are in all-time highs. So from 08 onwards, we've moved to a, a new level. This is a new league uh, in, in terms of correlation across the board, which has made it very hard for uh, stock pickers and for alpha generation. We've had uh, a bit of an attempt of mean reversion uh, late last year, earlier this year, that uh, blip down, but then we've quickly uh, went back uh, up. And uh, the next slide uh, is the German bonds, the two-year German bonds showing negative uh, nominal yield. So over the last couple of months, we've had people happy to pay the German government up to 10 basis points um, uh, to uh, get that German paper and uh, the luxury of uh, them protecting their capital. Uh, on top of that, you have 2% in inflation, so the, re the real yields are just ridiculous. But that's the kind of ridiculous stage of markets we're in. It's a very, very uh, panicky type of mode. Again, the tide will turn. We will see a risk aversion. And last but not least, this final slide of uh, long term. Uh, you've got to be long term. Uh, we are long term. I think uh, most of us around this room are. Uh, this slide shows the returns of the MSCI world, the red line. Then MSCI, well, it's gone nowhere for a decade and a half. Then MSCI emerging, uh, it's doubled, uh, trebled, sorry, uh, over that same period, the green line. And then the blue line on the top is an actively uh, managed um, uh, portfolio in emerging markets, equities primarily. And uh, you could see that uh, over the long term, if you can weather those, that, that bumpy ride of minus um, 40 in the Russian crisis, minus 50, minus 60, minus 20, then uh, it pays off. Well, thank you very much for your attention.